Come on. <laughs> well, hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to our first webinar of this fabulous 2020 year. Happy New Year to everyone. Yes, join in, say hello, let us know where you are watching from. Um, I'm just so excited about today. I've missed all of you and I'm just ready to go. Today's webinar is going to be fabulous. I have a lot of rich, wonderful content for you. And please be sure to jump in and share your ideas too as I go through today's webinar. How's everyone doing out there? How, how are you doing with weather and all that crazy stuff? I don't know. We've had a pretty good winter here in Vegas, what we consider winter, not that they're ever really bad, but <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, I'm Joan Burge, founder and CEO of Office Dynamics International. We are the global leader in the development and presentation of sophisticated training programs and information for administrative office professionals. And we are super excited. This is our 30 year anniversary. Yes, we have been cherishing your profession. Well, I've been cherishing it for about 50 years, <laughs> but we've been supporting you for 30 years. And we are super excited about special events we have planned for you in celebration of this special anniversary. And I'll tell you more about them later. Oh, hello from Germany. Wow. That's a long way away from here. I'm also excited because today we broke our record with registrants. We have 7,025 assistants who registered for today's program. So that's super exciting. And speaking of that, I'm going to ask you a favor this year to help me celebrate the 30th year. And that ask is to please tell all your friends and colleagues about these webinars. I would love to hit 10,000 registrants this year. That's my goal. I want us to be able to reach and help impact as many administrative professionals as possible. And I need your help. I can't do it alone. And don't forget too that you could watch the webinars with a group of assistants. So, you know, that's something else to think about. Oh, we've got someone all the way from Brazil. Um, yes, 10,000. That's my goal. All right. The learning part of today's program will be about 45 minutes. Then I've got some important announcements I need to share with you. And then we're going to do Q&A. So don't go anywhere. You can submit your questions throughout the webinar. You don't have to wait until the very end. And when you uh, look down in the far right lower corner, I believe you'll see the same thing I did where we have the chat. There should be an icon uh, that will let us know that you have a question. That way Malia can pull those faster and we can get more questions answered. What else? If you have any technical issues, the only way we can respond to you is through the chat. So don't try to email Malia or call the office. Sorry, we can't help you there. We do not have a handout for today, so be sure to take good notes because I have a lot of good information for you. Of course, as you know, you can always go back and watch the replay. Um, so I decided to do something different today. I want to share a quote with you for the day. So I actually keep this right in front of me in my computer. And this is how I feel today. And I thought it would be fun for me to give you a quote today. So let's get our mindsets wrapped around this quote. And it said, let the winds of enthusiasm sweep through you. Live today with gusto. All right. So let's do this webinar with gusto, everyone. And please contribute, engage, give us your ideas. And we're going to have an awesome time. All right, let's move on. Today, I'm going to share with you nine steps to earning your place on the executive team. And maybe some of you have already earned your place as far as your position. But we also want to earn our place in how we're viewed by the executive team, not just in title. So I have picked the nine 
uh, critical areas. These are the nine top areas that I believe are critical and that I have been sharing with assistants. So number one, you want to write this down, interface well. Now there's two types of interfacing. There is unintentional interfacing, which I'll explain in a moment. And then there is intentional interfacing. So obviously unintentional means you don't know you're doing it. You're not even thinking about it, but it's actually more important than your intentional interfacing. Unintentional is our secret ammunition and it will either be a roadblock to your success or it's going to help catapult your success. And what I mean by unintentional, of course, people are watching you all the time. You are on stage all the time. And I'll give you an example. Um, there was a, a really good example about the being on stage and being observed. So years ago, when I was an assistant, I was working at Coppertone in Memphis, Tennessee. Fun place to work. I was working for the vice president of marketing. It was just an absolute blast. We worked very, very hard, though. And um, we were going then. We had a reorg that was going to occur. The president of um, that division down there in Memphis was leaving, and there was a big shakeup. And I was one of the top assistants, you know, working for a vice president. And the vice presidents were going to be affected with their positions. So I started to think, well, where am I going to go? I mean, there aren't going to be any higher level positions opened. If my executive is moved or let go, then I'm out, you know, and there is no, no way. And I'm not, don't want to go down, right? So there was an executive who worked in the um, Dr. Scholl's division. So we had Coppertone, um, Maybelline, and Dr. Scholl's, and we would share this huge floor. And I had known that particular executive, and of course, he would come over and talk to my executive. So he knew me, he observed me, he would even see me in the shared copy room. And as we were going through this change, this executive came up to me one day and he said, would you like to interview for a position to the CEO of Boatman's Bank? My wife is the head of HR. And I said, of course. So unintentional at, um, marketing yourselves. It's what you're not paying attention to that you are doing but bottom line, you need to pay attention to what you're doing, okay? Because you're always on stage. Don't underestimate the value of your unintentional, okay, behaviors. So that has everything to do with how you're responding to conflict in the office, how you handle difficult people, how you are interacting with your coworkers, um, and especially now many of you are an open offices so you're being observed even more so you know than the old days okay um intentional interfacing this is when you want to purposely put yourself in front of someone in other words you want to maybe achieve a, a particular goal um you want to create some new opportunities for yourself so you have to put yourself in front of the right executives or leaders or managers, you know, whether they're in training, HR, you know, some other position. So the idea here is you need to strategically think how you will do that. How will you be visible to people? And so um, a couple examples I have, um, one I filled in for a CEO's assistant at one of the companies I worked at. I was working for a director at that time. We were on a whole different floor and she went on vacation. I was asked if I wanted to fill in. Of course, I said yes, even though I had a ton of work at my own desk. And I spent a week up on that other floor, which gave me great visibility. So I hope that makes sense to you. All right, number two. So number one was interface well. Number two is to think like an executive. 
I'm sure you've heard this before, but the idea is how can you think like an executive when you don't know what it's really like to be an executive? You can think, you know, as an assistant, you know, I did the same thing. You observe and watch executives, but not until I was an executive for years, not just even a year, did I really understand how executives think. So here are three tips for you. Number one, always go the extra mile. Always, that's what a good leader does. They go above and beyond, no matter how busy they are. And an example is assistants will tell me they don't want to attend a staff meeting, a man, an executive staff meeting because they're too busy. Well, if you want to be viewed more as part of the management team and taken more seriously, you know, and really get in that inner circle, attend the meeting. You will learn so much. It will truly be invaluable to you. You know, and that's the other part about thinking like an executive, because the other side of this assistance will say to me, well, I'm too busy. I don't have time to go sit in a meeting. Do you think executives say that? So if you want to think like an executive, if you want to be taken, you know, and viewed as part of that executive team, if you want to be that stellar assistant, you don't say things like that. You learn how to juggle the workload just like executives do and the people you support do. All right, number second is to preserve your professionalism and potential. Avoid anything that could diminish your professional presence, brand, or image, anything. So anything that might be questionable, and that's everything from your outer appearance to again, how you act, how you behave, how you respond to crisis, to conflict, all of that. Number three, read everything, be a sponge, be a sponge, but you especially want to read things like your executives read. So, and then a couple regular um, newspapers, like again, read USA Today, you know I always talk about that, if any of you have been following me for a while. Are there particular trade journals that your executive reads? And again, you don't have to read every issue that comes out. You don't have to read every word. You could skim those things. What are maybe digital newsletters your executive uh, gets? I would also encourage you to read annual reports, strategic plans, Go on LinkedIn, get the daily rundown of what's going on. Okay, number two, someone's asking, number two is think like an executive. Oh, thank you, Barbara, for answering that. And the three points, go the extra mile, preserve your professionalism, and read everything. You will not go wrong if you do that. All right, are we good? Is everybody ready? Okay, number three, learn what is important to your executive, right? Because what might be important to me with my assistant may not matter at all to another executive. I mean, I've seen this happen hundreds of times. So within this, um, I have a phrase and it's to get on the team, you need to play the game. So if you want to be on the team, right, and especially building those bonds with your own executives, really learning what is important to them matters. And that takes good communication. Don't assume because they don't say anything that there isn't anything on their mind that you could be doing better or changing. OK, sometimes they don't talk about it. So a couple ideas I have four for you. Number one. Pay attention to the details. Observe the higher ups, you know, that are around you that you work with, their actions, their body language, um, even how they dress. I mean, if you have an executive who's a meticulous dresser, then you should be dressing meticulously. You are a mirror 
of your executive. Now, that doesn't mean if your executive dresses like, uh, you know, not too good to not do that. <laughs> okay, that's the one time you don't want to mirror what they're doing, <laughs> right? Um, second, listen carefully. Executives drop clues all the time. It's amazing. They will drop clues about what is important to them and, and what isn't. And, you know, a lot of times I'll hear an executive say this is important to their assistant and the, the assistant doesn't grab the importance. So if you hear your executive say, you know, this is really important that we manage this, we handle that, or you get that taken care of, take that to mean it's really important to do it. Um, but also around this one, what's important to an executive. So I'll give you a specific example. Years ago, I was coaching a president and an executive assistant of an organization. She was a top-notch executive assistant. They brought me in to just help fine-tune their processes. And she did a wonderful job of, of color coding his calendar and printing it out in color for him and all of that. Through discussion, be facilitating the discussion, we realized he could care less that it was in color. Now, not that it takes a whole lot of extra time to do that, but the point is they never really discussed, was that a big deal? Was that important to the executive? Number three, when in doubt, ask. Get your executive's perspective on things. You're not expected to know everything that's in their brain. So, um, you know, I, I believe this is true. I mean, no matter how long you've been working together, because things change, people change. You know, what mattered to me maybe a year ago doesn't even matter to me today because my priorities have changed. You know, thing, so don't assume again what your executives were pleased with in May of 2019 is still important to them today. Things are shifting constantly. So I wanna encourage you to have those daily huddles that I talk about so that you stay on track, you are clear on expectations, so you can be proactive and take the initiative and work alongside your executive. And not just your executive, the other executives too, because we're talking about being on the team, not just only with your one executive. And last, learn and mirror executives speak. I love this. I love, love, love this. And I do it to this day. I listen to the words executives use. I read the words executives use. I love it. They have their own language. So pay attention, be observant this year, and mirror those words as well. All right, let's see. I'm just looking at some of the, the comments there. All right, number four, help your executive look good. Now, I know many of you do this. I know many of you know this. Let's just look at a few points. I have three under this one. So the first is to be an office liaison. So what does liaison mean when I say that? Be a good office liaison. Any thoughts? Some words I have, conduit, right? You're a conduit for your executives. Um, one assistant said, I'm the bridge between the executive and everyone else, correct? You are, you are that representative. You are that ambassador. Conduit to the CEO, you're the ambassador. Great, what else? Be the eyes and ears of the office for your executive buffer. Great, I love that. Um, gosh, you're doing really good. Great communicator. You're the gatekeeper. That's right. You're all these things. I mean, just look at this list. You are important people. You make a difference. And so we all know as assistants, right? When we make our executives look good or the management team look good, they are very happy. And, you know, with that, I mean, make them look good all the time. If you are, you know, talking negatively behind their back or about the man management team decisions they've made, that doesn't sit well. 
So remember, if you're viewing yourself as being a part of that management team, you understand business is business. And while not all decisions are popular in the eyes of employees, your organization, I am sure, has done their due diligence before they make a decision. They're not doing these big decisions randomly. So don't take it personally. The next is to anticipate and act on challenges. So the thought there is to think about what might make my manager look bad. So now you're being proactive, right? You're thinking about, all right, my executive showing up for a meeting. I mean, what would make my executive look bad is if she didn't have all the information at her fingertips, if she didn't have the most current minutes you know, from the last meeting, that's going to make her look bad. She's going to be embarrassed. So this is a little different because now you're thinking proactively, you're anticipating what could happen and you don't want anything to happen that's going to make your executive, you know, not look professional or like they're together. All right. And then the third point I have is no who's who. This is really important. And so I've been coaching a great uh, team. Um, he's the president of a large organization and his assistant. We've been doing the coaching virtually. And the executive one day brought up something about, you know, my assistant understanding my stakeholders. And he said to me, you know what, I bet she doesn't even know who the stakeholders are. And he wasn't being mean. He was just saying it like maybe he hasn't talked to her about it. Well, in my private conversation with her, I asked her, do you know who the stakeholders are? She said, you know, to be honest, I don't think I do. So when we got on our joint call, he, the uh, president, was clear and helped explain that. So do you really know who is who? Who's important to your executive? And I also have another CEO who I coached this year. I've been doing a lot of great coaching with executives. And he also said about his assistance when it came to his calendar and moving uh, things around on the calendar, my assistant needs to know who are the stakeholders. They don't get moved. They are the ones who are business. They impact the business. So really, really important. Um, number one was interface well. All right, how's everyone doing? We're going to go on to number five. So there are nine that I'm sharing with you today. We're on number five. Be a value-added partner. In today's crazy competitive world, it's not enough to be good enough, you know, um, or to just do your job well. And I know you're working really hard out there. So there's three points under how to be a value-added partner. Number one for assistance, be a cognitive being. And I actually, my first big book I wrote for assistance talks all about this, become an inner circle assistant. It's the first thing I started talking about years ago. You're not just a task doer and order taker, right? You need to use your brains. Um, to the, and, and thinking about in your day-to-day, -day, how can you add value? Now, this doesn't mean necessarily add more to your plate. It doesn't mean get busier. It doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I need to work two extra hours a day. No, 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 no. With, with in what you're doing, how can you add more value? Now, yes, it may be taking on a project or assignment from your executive as a way to add value. But think about if you negotiate prices, if you have anything to do with outside vendors or any vendors, um, if you plan events, ex external events, conferences, retreats for your executives, could you negotiate? That's a way you add value, right? You're saving your company money. The second, of course, is to streamline your job, streamline your processes. That's always a way. Because if, if we streamline our processes, if we look at how to do things more efficiently, you're saving time. Time is money. Money impacts the bottom line. 
So do you see it all comes together? It's a domino effect. Number three, I've talked quite a bit about um, in world-class assistant. I started talking about this over 15 years ago. Understand the scope of your executive's work. Scope is not their to-do list. Scope is the reason they get up every morning. The scope of their work is why they stay up till all hours of the night and work on the weekends, okay? It's what drives them. What's their real passion? Why are they really there? Why do they put up with, with what they put up with? So you need to have like a verbal conversation regarding the scope. Okay, how's everyone doing? So we've had five so far, and the one I just reviewed was be a value added partner. Everyone good? Great. All right, number six, I love this one. It's all about you, promote yourself, okay? You've really got to make yourself visible today. And, and again, this isn't anything new I, then you know i've been talking about this for years but it's even more so today there's so much chatter out there and so much noise with all the technology and social media you have to make yourself known so here are six ways to promote yourself are you ready let me wait till you catch up um what is before streamline your job it was be cognitive I'll wait to catch up with me. And by the way, I just want to tell you, you retain more information when you take notes. I know it's hard when you don't have a handout, and I'm not saying we're not ever going to give handouts, but there are proven studies. We retain more information when we have to write it. And personally, I love to do that. Okay, number six, promote yourself. Number one, share positive accomplishments via status updates. So when you, when you accomplish something, and it's not every little thing you finish, okay? Of course we know that. But as you accomplish certain things, maybe you just worked on a big meeting, okay? Um, or maybe, um, I don't know, there's some special project you've been given. Be sure to, to let your executive or the other executives or managers know that you have accomplished that and what you have done. Um, I know Malia one day did, did something that I thought was really good and um, she has so much interaction with people on the telephone. You know, they're, they're the first point, she is the first point of contact. And um, one day when we were talking, I don't know if we were doing a review or whatever, but she had kept a record of her interactions on the phone with people. And as a result, how people came to our classes because Malia was being very responsive and doing a great job giving them the information they needed. And I wasn't even aware that she was doing this and keeping track of things. And, you know, I realized how much of an impact she has with the assistants out there. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about and you're not doing it in a bragging way, you know? All right, number two, stay visible to the right people. Again, you wanna be strategic in your career. Who needs to know what you do? Who needs to, to know what you're capable of doing? Number three is to take action the one way you promote yourself is just jump in do it help wherever be visible number four i love this one do something for others first so while this is i'm saying this is about you but one way things become about us is because we really care about other people so the idea is to really get to know your peers and other people in the organization, know their goals, what they're trying to accomplish, any hurdles they're trying to overcome, and then help and assist wherever you can. And the one thing I have found in over 40 years of being in the workplace, 50 years now, is I just do things because I want to do them and help others. But what I've discovered is it comes back to me. 
in some way, some shape, some form. It may come back to be two or three or four years later, but I don't go in with that intent. I go in with the intent of just helping others succeed or helping others overcome their obstacles and their challenges. All right, number five, always speak optimistically. Always, 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 please, if you have to complain and moan and groan, which I know it happens sometimes, you're just tired and overworked. But just be careful where you're doing that. Try to save it for when you get home or when you go out with a good friend. You know, you could do your venting then, but be that positive spokesperson. Um, and again, seeing yourself as a representative of your organization. Number six, this is one of my favorites. Do not open mouth until brain is in gear. All right, maybe you know some assistants that they're not thinking before they speak. So make sure that, you know, before you speak, you really thought about what you're going to say. Oh, Glenda, sorry, you have to leave us. Be sure to, to um, listen to the replay. <laughs> All right, number seven. We're moving along pretty fast, but that's all right. That means we have more times for more time for Q and A from you. Number seven is to think you ink, you ink. So if you think about a company, think about your own organization. You have assets and you have liabilities. So this is actually a little sheet which you could create for yourself. Okay. And so on your asset column, you want to think about what differentiates you from your competitors. All companies have to think about what are the strengths I bring to the table? What are the strengths we bring to the table? So right now, maybe in the chat, I'd love to see, can you share with me one of your assets? What are one of the things that differentiates you or what do you feel is one of your gifts or talents you bring to work. Okay, one idea. Patience, organized, unflappable. Oh, I love that, resourceful, proactive. Oh my gosh, ah, keep going, dependability, smiles, high standards, positive attitude. Wow, approachable. Look at all the different areas of strengths you have. Calm under pressure, dependable, confidentiality, reliability, integrity. These are all wonderful gifts that you bring to your organization and to your executive. Inclusion, adaptable, good listener. I love that. Have a common sense, willing to be a team player, patience, fabulous, fabulous. Bilingual, wow, notary, ah, that's some extra talent. They are a good partner. All right, so do you see the idea is to make a list of at least four, and I'm sure you could come up with them very quickly um, on that column. Then you're gonna have a column called liabilities. Now, liabilities I know sounds negative, but that's the word we relate to, okay? And the way I framed this is what is limiting you from your full potential. So where do you not feel as strong as you would like to be or what gets in the way? So for example, for some assistants, they're not, they don't feel confident enough or they don't know how to assertively communicate their needs. So now could you share with me, hate my job and can't get moved, oh dear. <laughs> Missing the details, okay, that's a good one. That's good. What else? Other ideas now, let's look with the other lens. What might we need to, you know, grow where we're not at our full potential? Math, oh, that's a good one. Numbers, I don't like numbers either. Technology, I could relate to that one. I know that's limiting me that I'm not, you know, I need to embrace technology more. That's on my goal list for 2020. Public speaking, 
awesome. So many assistants are afraid to speak in front of a group. So maybe this year you can join Toastmasters. It's fabulous. Um, wear emotions on my sleeve. All right. Thank you for that one. So then you would put your focus on that. You would say, okay, this is my goal for 2020. By the end of this year, I'm going to develop that. I'm going to really work at not wearing my emotions on my sleeve. And you really concentrate on that. Being sensitive, taking too much personally. And some of these things are just who we are inside. They're what I call in our DNA, but it doesn't mean we can't get better at these things. We don't want to use them as a, a crutch. So keep, you know, keep working on those. So that would also go on your goal sheet for 2020. Get distracted, get behind. Let's see. I like to be behind the scenes and not bring attention to myself. Okay, so that's a really good comment because there are a lot of assistants um, a lot of people, even, you know, who aren't assistants, who don't like to be, you know, on stage per se. But the idea of why I'm encouraging you to put yourself out there is because managers and executives can't use you for certain things if they don't know what you're capable of doing, if they don't know your talents. So you want them to be able to leverage your strengths and leverage what you do. And the other thing is to always keep yourself marketable. Always, always. Everything's changing all the time. There's reorganizations, there's downsizing, there's all kinds of stuff, right? So by putting yourself out there and again, letting people see what you're capable of, that could help you down the road if you need it. Overthinking, that's a good one. Thank you. All right, um, within this Think Like You Inc., so what you want to do is in your asset column, use those skills as much as possible because those are the, the things that you are naturally good at. So if you're very organized, you're an organized person, use that, leverage that, okay? And then, like I said, for your goals for 2020, you want to develop the other areas that you mentioned. And the, let's see, the last point I want to make with this too is to see yourself as an independent contractor with a bag of skills. Don't see yourself as um, like an employee of the company. See yourself as the independent contractor who has this fabulous skill set to offer anyone. That Any executive would be thrilled to have you. Any company would be thrilled to have you. And I think when you see yourself in that sense, you're also going to be more inclined to want to develop yourself and do your very best job. All right, are you ready for number eight? Oh, I like to see my boss as my client. That's really good. All right, number eight is to use a creative approach. So, um, in other words, if you want to really demonstrate your worth and what you're able to do, use a creative approach to doing it. And here's what I mean. So one example is to have a career portfolio. Have you heard me talk about a career portfolio? It is a huge part of our world-class assistant designation course. It We also talk about it in our STAR class. But I, I've been speaking on career portfolio, I don't know, for 20 years. <laughs> but I want to tell you, I in two, three weeks over the holidays, I got emails from assistants who were in our courses. One was in STAR, one was in World Class, where they learned how to put together their career portfolios. Both of them got promotions. And part of it was what they learned in the class, and that they had a career portfolio, which knocked the socks off the executive who was interviewing them. And one of them is working for a huge organization and a top level executive, a president. So that says a lot. A career portfolio is nothing to laugh at or ignore. Make this the year that you're 
Oh, good, you're going to come to Las Vegas. Good. I will look forward to seeing you, Danielle. Um, the second is to use a creative approach to just anything you do. You know, think about how you communicate with others. How do you communicate with your executives? Use a creative approach. So I'll give you an example. And I know this is just a part of who I am, but you can also develop creativity. This is another thing we teach. So for example, I belong to a CEO group. It's Vistage, maybe you've heard me talk about it. We have monthly meetings. They're all day, very long, intense meetings from 7.30 to 5 with basically very short little, we have a few little breaks, working lunch. They're very intense mentally. So we have for each meeting, somebody is supposed to be the energizer. And what the energizer does when it's time to take a break, maybe every 90 minutes or two hours, for two minutes, you get up and you energize the group. Well, the typical way most people energize is let's stretch, let's you know twist, oh, let's do jumping jacks. Um, you know, let's bend over those types of things. Well, I started when I first became the energizer, I put on music, I pumped it up. I was doing all this crazy stuff. I was having them sing and whatever. Well, since then they were like, all right, you need to be the official energizer. <laughs> so whenever I do the energizer things, I'm always thinking of something creative. Like at Christmas for our December meeting, I brought in Santa hats for the, the men. Um, I brought in holiday headbands for the women. We had jingle bells on their wrists and bells that they could shake. Uh, what else? Oh, we had really fun holiday glasses that they had to put on. So anytime we did the Energizer, everybody had to put this stuff on. They laugh so hard. We have more fun. So the cool thing is everybody's like, I can't wait to see what Joan's going to do next. So all I'm saying is use your creativity. I mean, one thing, you have a lot more fun. It makes work a lot more fun. You make other people happy. Um, you're not going to get bored. Uh, there's so many benefits. And then third, um, maybe you can, let's see, uh, come up with a creative approach on how to keep your executive on time. That's another example, right? Any other ideas on what you, how you can use a creative approach really to a lot of things that you do on a regular basis, sending out meeting announcements, use a creative approach to it, put a different spin on it. When your executive's hosting a department meeting, add some element to that meeting to make it fun so people wanna come to that staff meeting. You love my haircut, thank you, Catherine. Um, as far as the career portfolio, if you go to our website, officedynamics.com, there is um, an article, just put it in the search, career portfolio. I've written a whole article about why you uh, create a portfolio, because it's not only interviewing. That is like one eighth of what a career portfolio is used for. I have in there what to put in your portfolio, how to present your portfolio. So just go to Office Dynamics website. And if you want to put one together, hands on, come to World Class Assistant because we take a whole you know, couple hours to have you put together a portfolio and all the participants talk to each other and some have portfolios and they bring it to the class. It's really cool. Okay, number nine. I'm watching our time map out a career strategy. The quote is from me, if you do not plan where you are going, you will go where everyone else wants to take you. You've got to have a plan for your career. Now the plan could be, I am staying in this position this year and I'm gonna take my performance up a notch. I'm not saying it has to be to go to another job but you should have a career strategy and a part of that is your education strategy. And I have this, this visual, this was from another program I had done for another group. That's why you're seeing some of my handout or my uh, slides. But if you look at this visual, 
you can either take a direct route from getting from point A to point B, or you could just zigzag all over the place. Zigzagging is when you don't have a plan. So obviously you want to take the most direct route to growing your career, strategizing it. And in fact, I, I believe um, the next webinar is February 4th. Julie Reed is going to be on with me. She's our VIP elite trainer. And we are, it's called Love Your Career. And one of the things we're going to get into is how do you map out a strategy for your career and your education? How do you really know what's a good path? How do you get started? All right, really, um, before, stay on everybody, don't go anywhere. We still have Q&A, but I have several really important announcements today kicking off the new year. And I wanted to make sure everyone could hear them from me. So I'm going to take just a moment of your time they, and share these with you. And then we're going to go to Q&A. So first of all, we have a new downloadable ebook. I don't know if you've noticed, we've been publishing ebooks now on a pretty regular basis for you. That's very affordable. And the one that we're releasing today, and you're the first to hear about it, it's earning your rightful place on the executive team. Um, and we have a discounted price for you because, and I forgot, now I lost that little sheet that Brian so nicely gave you. There's a really good savings, let me put it that way, um, before we release it to the public. So the discount is good for today. Brian, what was that discount? I'm so sorry, I know you gave me a note about it. The discount is uh, $7 off. The regular price is $19.95. Today it's $12.95. Awesome. And I'm going to put a pop up um, where people can uh, click to go purchase it. And the discount code is EARN7 in all caps. Thank you so much. Um, so, anyways, it, it will build on what I covered today. There might be some added, um, obviously, pieces of information. I think it's about a 15 page ebook. So, next. Um, I'm going to start hitting the road. February 20th is my first event, my first public event. I'm going to be in Orlando. Very excited to go see all my friends in Orlando. I'm partnering with the IAAP Central Florida chapter, doing a half-day program, quite cost-effective. It's called uh, Jones 20 Tips for 2020. You can sign up for that at the Office Dynamics website. All of these you can sign up for. Next, it's our 30 year anniversary and we have a 12 month calendar filled with things to celebrate you. We are gonna have so much fun. I'll tell you about uh, Houston in a minute. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, we have a lot of things. We're going to celebrate a lot of national holidays throughout the month. For example, January 31st is National Fun at Work Day. So if you want to join in, I'll be doing something on Facebook Friday Live. But we're going to have a great time this year. Lots of, uh, oh, we're going to have games for you, competitions. We're going to have lots of giveaways and prizes and gifts and just celebrate you and your profession um, because we're here because of you. And then in honor of that, I am doing a four city tour. It's a one day, very robust, immersive program. And during that time, I'm going to share my story um, and all the lessons I learned that are lessons that would be very relevant to you today how to be resilient, how to overcome your obstacles, how to you know, map out that strategy for yourself. It's called Timeless Skills for Assistance. I am starting in Orlando in April on Administrative Professionals Day. So I'm so excited. I'm gonna be actually out there on Administrative Professionals Day. I'm gonna be going to Chicago, Denver, and Nashville. Again, you could find this out at our website. And then the other thing that's going big time this year is our world-class assistant designation course. It's a tremendous, robust curriculum taught by Julie Reed and by me. 
Um, my classes are going to be in Las Vegas. We have another phenomenal trainer, Joanne Linden. She's head of Admin Universe. We co-partner. She's a licensed user. She's going to be in San Jose. And then we're going to Boston, Baltimore, Chicago, Minneapolis, Seattle, and Denver. So you told us for years, come to our cities, come to our cities. We're coming out there. So show up. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I think that's it for my announcements. And again, you could find out all this information at officedynamics.com. And don't forget our officedynamicsconference.com website because we have a phenomenal conference this year. It's called 2020 and Beyond. And I have some very special executive assistants coming to, to talk about how they progressed, how they achieved what they achieved, and how they're seeing that vision for the future. All right, let's go to questions. I, oh, we're in Seattle. Okay, good question. So one thing I do want to share with you, Malia is working very hard to pin down venues. So um, I believe, I mean, Malia could clarify this, uh, for the cities, where do we have our ven? What cities are already booked with venues? Uh, the ones that are already booked are Houston, Nashville, and Chicago. So where are we going to be in Houston again? Um, in no. Houston. Sorry, yes. I caught you off guard. You did catch me off guard. <laughs> okay, well, it's on our website. If you go to the website, South select the city. It'll drop down. It'll show you where we're going. Um, she is working on the other cities. If you know of any great hotels where we should maybe host our world-class assistant, please write Malia. Please. M Amira, M for Malia, Amira at officedynamics.com. You know his, his, his assistants, it is so hard to, to call venues and get all this information. So if you have an idea for us, we would love to, to hear what you um, might suggest for us. And what else? Um, in March, Julie Reed will be teaching hers in Houston. She'll be teaching in Houston the same week I'm teaching world class in Las Vegas. So Julie's gonna be doing a lot of training for us. She's been doing a lot of great work and she's phenomenal. She was handpicked by me, hand taught by me. And she's been teaching several of our courses for about five or six years now. Um, for guides on how to plan off-site meetings, Tisha, um, I believe, Tisha, we have a book now in our success store. I didn't write it, but it's about meeting planning. Correct, Brian? That someone wrote about uh, when you're planning. Yes, that's correct. I'll put a link in the chat box. Okay. All right, Malia, um, if you have any, we'll see them in your questions also, please feel free, call the 800 number and ask us anything you want. Malia loves to help. So, <laughs> all right, uh, world class, will it ever come to Canada? Sorry, I'm looking at all these questions. <laughs> it certainly may come to Canada. Um, I think right now we're focused on these cities. We wanna see how it goes. Uh, that's the other big part of this, um, where we need your help. Tell people about these, because if we see people are coming to the different cities, we will be more inclined to offer world-class assistant in more cities. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Question. Okay, Chelsea says that she has an executive that is very independent. She books her own meetings, travel, etc. She rarely reaches out for her assistants. And sometimes she feels a bit lost on how she can assist her better, but she just takes it into her own action, um, the boss does. So how can she establish herself to better assist her executive? Oh, this is such a good question. And it's, it's also one that is asked often because executives are more independent today. They're tech savvy, tech savvy. What they don't realize is they shouldn't be doing these things, even if they're capable of doing them. So I always say, you know, the number one thing is to try to get your executive to sit down for a 15, 20 minute conversation and really 
again, be clear on what's going on in your head and really express how you can really help increase her productivity by 25% or 20% if you can manage the calendar, if you can manage the meetings, you know, and any other of those little things that your executive is doing. Get her to see that if you actually take on some of those nitty gritty responsibilities, she'll be freed up to focus on the more important things that affect the business, that impact the bottom line. And those are exactly the kind of words you have to use. That, that's the message executives get. The other, how often should we have these conversations? I think you should have these conversations almost regularly. I mean, this is why when Malia and I have daily huddles, it's a perfect time for us to, to talk about the expectations, you know? Um, and I could do a whole webinar just on this. And in fact, by the way, I'm doing a webinar, um, it's going to be in March, and the title is Managing a Complex and Dynamic Office Through Communication. And that's the whole essence of that webinar. It is so, so important, and I see it every single time I coach these executives and assistants one-on-one. -on -one. It all boils down. They're not communicating often enough, and they're not commuting communicating context. Um, so going back with your executive, the other thing, try to insert yourself wherever you can. In other words, don't wait for permission to do something. You could always ask for forgiveness. Um, the other, a great question to say to your executive too, if you know what your executive's working on, what can I do to get that started for you? Instead of, oh, can I help with that? And then I say, no, well, that leaves you at no. But if you say to me, what can I do to help get that started? Now I'm thinking differently. So sometimes we don't get the answers we want because we didn't ask the right question. So those are a few quick tips. We could spend an hour on this, I'm sorry. But you know, if, try a couple of those things first. And then also go to my website, look at the blogs. There's over a thousand blogs. I have a ton on communicating with your executives and also go to our YouTube channel. I have over 350 videos out there. So I don't even know if you're all aware of that. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so Debbie um, has an interesting comment. She said, why would an HR representative at a career fair tell her that her career portfolio is a brag book? and that she has too much in it. <laughs> ah, God bless her, because yeah. she doesn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to her, <laughs> just because she's HR. <laughs> it is a brag book, uh, and it's great. So, um, you, you know, don't listen to her. You know, maybe it hasn't worked for her in the past. Maybe she thinks it's a waste of time. But I could tell you, it certainly opens the eyes of many executives, including me. First time I saw one like 27 years ago, I hired a girl because she came in with this little portfolio and I've never forgotten it. Nice. OK, uh, Sandra wants to know, um, what if your executive is in meetings all the time and doesn't always have time for daily huddles? What would you suggest? in this type of working situation that she do? Okay, uh, two thoughts. First of all, first of all, an executive has to be committed to this. In other words, those are just excuses. I'm in meetings all day. You know what, come in a half hour earlier and talk to each other. Come in 15 minutes earlier. The reason I know this is because when I was 26 years old, I had an awesome executive, John Guinness, who was busier than ever, traveled internationally all the time, was in the office hours into the evenings, worked on the weekends. He was a top vice president and he always made time for me. I was the first person he always met with. So I don't buy this executives being too busy. 
It's a matter of commitment. And I've coached CEOs of big corporations who are very busy. And you know what? They make the time. So I'm just I'm just telling you this is a side note between us. OK, it's a matter of commitment. So but the one thing you can do, your huddle could be on the telephone. It could be as they're driving into the office. You can do a five minute huddle. And the other part of that is when you do a huddle every day, they don't take long. Sometimes Malia and I meet for two minutes. I stand it. I just stood at her desk this morning for like two minutes. That's it. If you wait a week or two weeks or three weeks, now you've got this hour meeting. Well, of course they hate that. So um, again, you, you could do that huddle really quick if they're in the office. Obviously, when they travel, when they travel, you're not going to do that huddle every single morning. Um, but you should do a status update, at least with your executive, even if it's in writing during those travel times. OK. Um, Sigrid and Kate both kind of had the same question regarding always going the extra mile um, mm -hmm. in their experience. Um, the unintended side effect is burnout or it creates extra work or it causes people to bring everything to you when it really should be their job to do. So yeah, what would you suggest for them? That's really good. Thank you for bringing um, that comment because I I don't want you to get burned out. Okay, um, I so one is knowing when to say no. I'm not. I don't mean you have to say yes to every single thing. Um, but to me, that going the extra mile might be in the little things that you do. So I think about when we set up a class, you know, and Malia sets up our world-class assistant program and we have all our materials out. Malia will add little touches, like she'll bring, you know, bowls of snacks for them. Um, some, what are some of the other little things? You'll put out a little goodie gift for each assistant, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just adding that little extra touch you know, to something you're working on, but you definitely have to be careful of burnout. You've got to take time. It's just kind of whatever you do, do it exceptionally well. And if there's any little extra step you can add, add it. And I know it's 1102, but I'm happy to stay on for five more minutes. So those of you who want to stay on, is it proper? I got to get this one. Is it proper to huddle via text messages? text. I keep my phone closed. Basically, no. <laughs> and I'm telling you why. Because the value comes in the verbal when you're talking to each other because you stimulate each other's thinking, your ideas. It gives you an opportunity to clarify what you think you heard. So that is not going to be the most effective tool. Okay. All right, go ahead. Um, okay, um, let's see. Joyce says she was hired to support, I was hired to support my remote executive as well as open a new office. The rest of the team is located in San Francisco. What would be your suggestion on how to connect with the team? The executive and Joyce are the only ones that are located remotely from the others. Um, well, I'm wondering if you could then maybe use, um, you know, like Skype or Zoom, um, something where maybe once a week you could at least have that visual with each other, WebEx, you know, whatever is available. I mean, thank goodness there is technology today. And then you could connect throughout the week through emails, you know, communication. But if once a week you guys could set a time and everybody Whoever can attend gets on. I think that would be great because, again, it's in the speaking to each other. And you're just, it's, it's just different. It's so different. So that's a good question. Do we have another question? Um, Marina, how can I make a change in an environment which regards assistants as clerks and they don't understand the value they have to offer? How do we help them understand that we are partners? Oh, gosh, gosh, so good. So these are such awesome questions, all of you. Uh, it, it takes time, Juan. I just have to tell you, it takes time. I've been doing this business for 30 years of trying to get organizations to see the value of their assistance and to invest in professional development. But 
not to discourage you. I mean, I don't want to discourage you. Change is possible. I've seen it for 50 years. I saw it in my own career as a secretary. It takes each assistant, you know, again, just be your professional self in everything you do. Like I said, you know, learn more of, of what's going on. So you might be able to have better dialogue with these individuals. Sometimes you have to verbally educate them about what you're doing. You know, a, a great time to put something out is during Administrative Professionals Week. If a team of the assistants get together and you actually produce or publish a little newsletter, newspaper that educates your company about the role of the assistant. You know, it's a great time. It's 2020. Here's what's changed. Here's how you could be utilizing us. So, you know, that's a more subliminal way of educating them um, and, and getting to them to see that. And by the way, we have a, I have a white paper. It just got finished today, all the finishing touches on it. It's going to be going on our website page. I would highly recommend you access it. You get a copy. I'm trying to find where my draft is a minute. Um, it is, let me see, I don't have it with me. It is, the white paper is called, um, it's the Administrative Professional, a Vital Yet Overlooked Profession. And it's a whole case study with a lot of evidence and a lot of talk of how organizations need to see and value their assistance. So that hopefully, I hope it'll be up in a, a week. Brian's working on that right now. But I would encourage you, all of you, to print that white paper. It's very powerful. It's based on facts, you know, which executives love and hand it out to everybody you possibly can. I mean, that's one way we're gonna to create a wave of change. We all gotta be out there doing this, all of us. And the other thing is if someone in the workplace speaks to you in a way that is not acceptable to you, that makes you feel like you're just a clerk, you do need to speak up. You do need to say something, again, very nicely and professionally, but hold your ground. And, and you know, it's like, who came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, managers might say, well, you know, we'll treat assistants like they're partners when they act like they're partners, right? And assistants could say, well, they don't treat us that way. Well, then you, you know, you need to change your behavior. No, they need to change their behavior. Just somebody start doing it, okay? So be your professional best, set boundaries, assertively communicate. Educate, educate, educate. If you have any website, any company website where you could post things, I mean, they just don't get it. Don't be mad at them. They really just don't get it. So we've got to be those good teachers, those good advocates. We have to help them see. And once somebody sees, wow, it opens up a whole new world. And if you get one manager on board, they're going to tell another manager and they'll tell another manager. And that's how all this stuff spreads. I've seen it. Like I said, 50 years I've been around in this industry. It is good and it can get even better for all of you. All right, the white paper. Um, it's so silly. I should have it right here, Malia. I think it's on the uh, printer. Um, I'm going to give you the exact title, everyone. That's why I'm hesitating. Uh, Malia, could you go check it out real quick and I'll show you. It's going to be posted on uh, the Office Dynamics website. Brian is building a a special page for our 30-year anniversary where we're going to post a lot of events and things like that, but also uh, talk about some of the changes in the profession. Um, oh, it didn't print with color. All right, that's all right. <laughs> Sorry, it didn't print in color as I wanted it to, but that's all right. So, um, it's all in red and black and white, but the paper says it's the administrative professional, a vital yet overlooked contributor. And then the subline, ensure administrative staff meet the increasing demands of today's changing workplace. 
And the goal of this paper is to get companies and executives, HR people, to see how your role has changed and why they need to invest in you, why they need to have succession planning for assistance. There should be succession planning for you. In other words, what is your company doing to educate and train you and develop you so that when the baby boomers all start exiting, they've got people moving into these core slots, which when you're at the top, you don't have time to wait for a newbie to come in and learn. Um, Brian, let's see, I know everybody is gonna ask now. Um, that's the old, Honora, that, that's the old white paper actually that you put up. I mean, thank you for putting that up, but that's the, the old one, um, which 95% is the same, but I have edited it edited this and brought it up to date. And it's gonna even look more professional that what was on there. So Brian, um, the white paper is all ready to go. We're really waiting for Brian to do the website. Brian, is there another way we could get a link for the white paper to everybody? I can Maybe. just email all the webinar attendees a uh, link to, to download it. Okay. All right, so Brian said when he sends your replay link. No, 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 no. The replay link is already scheduled to go out. I'll oh. send a separate email with the white paper. Okay, got it. All right, he's going to send a separate email to all of you with the white paper. So it's an awesome read. Read it yourself. Like I said, get it in the hands of management, your own managers. They, they're just not aware. Please, let's make this the decade where we create a tsunami of change for you. Been at this 30 years and it's awesome, but wow, we're still climbing this mountain. Join me on this mission. It's your career. It's your profession. I love it to death but I need your help. I just can't do it all myself. Neither can my team. And we love you all. <laughs> all right. I guess we went long enough. Thank you for staying on. Please come to the February 4th webinar. Love your career with Julie Reed. We're going to have a lot more cool stuff for you. Bye, everybody.